As the Bitcoin block reward halving countdown continues to tick away, many are preparing in the crypto space for a bull run similar to what we saw in 2017. For others, they're not sure what this actually means. Join me on this episode as we deep dive into what the halving means and how less can mean more. G'day crypto goers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back or to the channel where we have an interesting article, again from the good people at Ainsley Bullion, about the incoming halving of the Bitcoin block rewards. The article reads, Unlike fiat currencies, which can be printed by central banks at will, the supply of Bitcoin is limited algorithmically. There are only 21 million Bitcoins which will ever be in existence. This, by definition, makes it a deflationary asset as opposed to an inflationary one. Every 10 minutes, a block of Bitcoin transactions is solved by miners and added to the Bitcoin blockchain. This is complicated and expensive work, demanding a lot of electricity and specialized hardware. So why would anyone do it in the first place? Because the algorithm rewards miners with new Bitcoins, which are generated and added to the circulating supply every 10 to 20 minutes. This distribution of new BTC is known as the block reward. Now what is also important about new Bitcoins, also called virgin coins, which have never been on the market before, are in fact proving to have a greater value than coins that have been used in the past. Why is that? Because the transaction of any Bitcoin in any proportion can be tracked for years, well, essentially forever, over the blockchain, there are many investors who want new or virgin coins because they will have no links ever to anything bad. Unlike cash, that can be used for something bad and you'd have no record of that, except for perhaps finding some cocaine on notes, which is apparently an interesting statistic in America where there are many US dollars that have high traces of cocaine and other drugs. When you're using Bitcoin, you can actually see on a transaction history where that coin has been. Now, that's not to say that all coins won't have a value in the future. That is, Bitcoin won't be tainted for life simply because it could have been used in a bad transaction. What it is saying, though, is that if coins attract to something bad and if a government or a central power or another body or even an investor says I don't want that coin that has a bad history to it, a trace of metaphoric cocaine on it, what will actually happen and what is happening is these new virgin coins produced by miners are becoming more valuable. When Bitcoin first appeared in 2009, the block reward was 50 BTC. This means that every 10 minutes, somebody somewhere was getting 50 Bitcoins delivered to their wallet. This was back in the days when BTC was worth pennies and you earn a block reward using only a laptop. Currently, the block reward is only 12.5 BTC. Now let's just pause on that thought for a second. Can you imagine back in 2009, knowing what you know today, or even ignorantly not knowing what you know today, and mining away on Bitcoin on their SHA-256 algorithm, and producing blocks of 50 Bitcoins by yourself on a laptop, let alone an ASIC miner, which didn't even exist back then for the SHA-256 algorithm. And within 10 minutes, in the early days, you yourself could produce entire block rewards of 50 Bitcoins. And this is where we have stories about people mining away in the background, not really thinking too much of Bitcoin, having a go at it, and mining thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin over a few years. And then horror stories of a girlfriend throwing out a laptop and this is a true story where people have thrown out a laptop. Those coins have gone forever. And in fact, even during my interview with Synth from Skycoin, he spoke about his sister who threw out a hard drive with about 60,000 Bitcoins on it. So this is not a unique story. It happened to a lot of people where they were mining away, creating thousands of Bitcoins virtually for free using very little power, especially comparative to what we use now. And they were producing 50 coins within 10 minutes. Then it got more competitive and you had to create mining pools. 
and those mining pools would, similar to a gambling pool, increase the likelihood of getting the block rewards and then distributing those coins amongst the pool. And then the halving happened and it went from 50 coins to 25 coins. And then the halving happened again and it went from 25 coins to 12.5 coins. And now we have another halving coming up where it's going to cut in half from 12.5 coins to 6.25 coins per block. So we need more power and more mining pools, arguably, to create half the amount of Bitcoin. Why? Because there is only a supply of 21 million, 4 million of which we believe have been lost, which leaves us with a supply of only 17 million. And yet miners aren't pulling out of this game, not only because the price is going up itself, because in some ways also virgin coins are arguably becoming more valuable. So what has happened is that the block reward has been cut in half twice over the last decade. This is a feature programmed into Bitcoin and occurs every four years, 210,000 blocks. So every four years or 210,000 blocks, it cuts the reward in half. This process is predetermined and will continue until the last Bitcoin is mined, expected sometime in the year 2140. So if you look at this halving and then halving and then halving again every four years or 210,000 blocks, None of us today, God rest our souls, will be alive in 2140, unless we have some type of new AI technology probably formed by the blockchain, to see that last Bitcoin mined. This process is referred to as halving. It can have long-term effects on the price of BTC. It's expected to occur again in mid-May 2020, which isn't far away, and that'll bring the block reward down to 6.25 Bitcoins. You count down the days using this website that I showed at the beginning of the video. BitcoinBlockHalf.com shows us the Bitcoin reward halving countdown, and we can see also a snapshot of everything that's happening in the Bitcoin space itself, with a total Bitcoins in circulation of 18 million. Now remember I was saying before, we've lost 4 million, so there's only 17 million left. If you are a bit thrown off by that number of 18 million, that is 18 million have been mined so far. And of those 18 million mined, 4 million at an estimate have been lost. And in fact, I've even heard higher estimates of that. But let's say for argument's sake, 4 million have been lost. That means there are in fact only 14 million in circulating supply. Now then when we talk about circulation of people holding on for dear life, that is hodling these coins and not actually selling them, when you look at the statistics of active wallets that are actually trading in and out, some argue that there are in fact only 1 million circulating in the sense that there are only 1 million trading through exchanges and new coins gently and slowly coming onto the market through mining. But the other 13 million, arguably, are just being held. So these things are becoming super rare. This was an interesting theory. Someone said, well, what if all the banks buy it and just try and devalue it? That is, they just hold all the Bitcoins, they buy them all up. Well, the interesting theory with this is if you go out and buy all the Bitcoin and just lock it away, the sheer fact that you're buying those Bitcoin will increase the price of it. So imagine you're a billionaire holding all these Bitcoins trying to destroy the price. So you go out and buy them all, which I don't think you could buy all 14 million because again, there are people just holding on to this coin. Myself as an example. Well, now that you've created this asset, this commodity, this stock, this coin that is worth so much money, imagine holding on to all the coins that has a market cap as an argument for, I don't know, $500 billion. And you say, well, no, out of the goodness of my heart or what the hate for this coin, I'm not going to sell it and make $500 billion. So you can see the conundrum. You try and buy these coins for it to go up, and because they're becoming rarer, they go up. Or you try and buy the coins as a government or a bank to destroy the coins, and that itself makes it the price go up. And then even if you get all those coins, you're then holding this highly valuable commodity stock, coin, etc. And you say, well, I'm not going to sell it because I don't want it to succeed. Well, that's going to be very difficult to do, particularly when the market's saying, hey... Do you want half a trillion dollars for those coins? There has never been a stock, a commodity, or anything like this in history. And no, gold does not count, because we know that hundreds and hundreds of tons of new gold are mined out of the ground every year. And that amount, unlike Bitcoin, which is halved every four years, the amount of gold that we get out of the ground in real life actually goes up each year. For example, 100 years ago, China wasn't mining much gold. Now they're mining lots. 
other countries, including Australia as a first world country, we didn't have the mining equipment to mine so much gold out of the ground. And the better our technology and equipment becomes, the more gold we can pull out of the ground every single year. Will gold supplies in the ground run out? No one knows for sure. Even the best geologists in the world can't tell us exactly how much gold is in the ground. Moreover, some have argued that if we do find big stocks of gold in the ground, for example, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the price of gold will go down. And like a diamond market, if someone already knows about these huge reserves of gold and they trickle feed this gold into the market, you are actually manipulating the market and controlling the price of what is going into that market, just as we do with diamonds and in fact with any stocks. There are companies that mine up lots of steel. They've got lots of steel in big reserves. They could sell it today, but they say, well, we're going to trickle feed this into the market or not even feed it into the market, simply stockpile it and wait till the price of steel, iron ore essentially, goes up in price. And then they sell it into the market, which is a type of market manipulation. Now, all markets are manipulated, but the thing with Bitcoin is we can see, as we're looking at this site right now, exactly how many coins are in circulation. We know that no more than 21 million can ever be produced, and we know when the halving comes. So unlike gold when we're mining gold out of the ground, and we don't actually know how much could be mined next year, or the year after, or the year after that, we do know how much Bitcoin is out there. And unlike recovering gold from a sunken ship from the bottom of the ocean, which has and does happen, when Bitcoin is buried in a tip because your girlfriend threw it out on an old laptop or hard drive, there's no recovering that thing. And you probably have heard the story about where one guy actually lost millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin and he actually paid a crew to go to the tip he kind of triangulated where this hard drive could be and he paid workers a crew of workers to go out there and actually essentially sift through rubbish to try and find this hard drive it was a well calculated risk that is i'm going to spend this much money for that much possible reward unfortunately he never found that hard drive and all the bitcoin were lost forever so unlike that sunken ship at the bottom of the ocean even if you've got a crew of divers or rubbish sifters is good enough to find that lost treasure the next layer on top of that is remembering the keys to your wallet. And I still often think about my friend's father who bought lots and lots of Ethereum. So this is a crypto story, but not so much a Bitcoin story, but they run parallel. He made millions on Ethereum, but couldn't remember the keys to his wallet. He forgot his password and he'll never recover that money because there is no central body that he can go and knock on their door and say, hey, I forgot my PIN number to my credit card, or I forgot the password to my internet banking. Can you help us out? There is no third party to recover that, which again makes this commodity even more scarce. So the mining event is important for miners worldwide. With the reward being reduced, profitability will also be cut, at least in the short term. So old versions of specialized mining machines, known as ASICs, will stop bringing their owners any profit. Strange of Genesis Mining, says less hardware in circulation will serve the industry well in the long run. We are going towards a really heavy industry with much longer life cycles of the old machines. It's a very brutal event. Most inefficient miners will be wiped out, but it's driving the innovation. It's a psychological event and there is a tendency for the price to increase. From my experience, he says, a lot of miners are expecting the price to go up, so they reduce selling and weaken the selling pressure of the market. The market is moving towards the industrial mining and there won't be hype like it used to be anymore. There are significantly less crypto enthusiasts on the market now. So let's just explore this conundrum in more detail. When mining first occurred, that is when the Bitcoin white paper was released and it was launched in 2009, no one really cared about Bitcoin because first of all, no one knew about it, but also because it wasn't worth anything. So you could have people mining on laptops and desktops and arguably even the phone power that we have today back then generating a lot of reward in a quantity that is they were producing a lot of coins, but the value of each one of those coins was worth almost nothing. As we go through the crypto timeline and we can see people were becoming more aware of Bitcoin, more people were getting in on the mining. So the mining was becoming more difficult. The difficulty of getting those rewards was increasing. Concurrently, the block reward was halving every four years from 50 to 25 to currently 12.5 and shortly down to 6.25. Now, during where we are right now, 
In fact, I'd probably argue about a year or two ago, you had all these cowboys, myself included, entering the market and buying these ASIC miners, these powerful application-specific integrated circuit miners, but they were doing it at a very expensive price, that price being huge amounts of electricity and the cost of the ASIC miners themselves. As the price has stabilized and some of these cowboys, if you will, are exiting from the market, these ASIC miners are also being pulled out of the market because they're not producing enough power and people are turning them off. Concurrently, the difficulty is going up and the block rewards are about to go down. So we're now going to see the next generation of miners being put out. And in fact, we're already seeing this on Bitmain with miners going from 13 terahash per second up to over 50 terahash per second. And in the future, we're going to see 200 terahash per second. So whatever we create today as an ASIC miner is going to be not as powerful as the new miners of tomorrow. And this actually pushes people out of the market. They're like, well, my equipment's already expired. It's not worth that much anymore. In fact, it's worth nothing anymore, except for the power supply unit. You can take the old power supply units and plug it into many of the new miners. But that aside, that's the cheapest part of the miner. There's not really any value in these old ASIC miners. It's not like a graphics card where you can take it out of one computer and put it into another computer when you buy a different desktop. There's not really much you can do with them because they're application specific. They don't do anything else other than mine on the SHA-256 algorithm. So what this article is saying is that as we move through the crypto timeline and the cowboys exit out, there are in fact going to be, ironically, less people mining and more mining farms. And this is where it's also a counter concern. Some of these mining farms are going to take over the mining and become centralized, arguably, in places such as China and Russia. But in my opinion, the free market and the laws of the universe, that being where there is money to be made, people will jump in irrespective of what country they're from or where they are. And concurrently, you'll have a better type of ASIC miner coming out. Perhaps there'll be something new that isn't called ASIC anymore. Perhaps there'll be a new generation that'll be beyond ASIC miners that will create better efficiencies in mining using less electricity. But of course, there is only so much Bitcoin you can mine, particularly as there is a finite supply and the block rewards are going in half. That is, it's about to drop down to 6.25. What does it all mean? It means that Bitcoin will continue, in my opinion, not financial advice, to go up in price. It'll continue to go up in price because it is a finite resource or a finite commodity or a finite store of value that many people around the world have invested in and continue to invest in and cannot create more of beyond what's in the code. The block reward halving tends to have long-term positive effects on the price of Bitcoin. Why does this happen? There are a lot of theories. The most common one, however, comes down to the simple supply and demand. If fewer Bitcoins are being generated, the newly increased scarcity automatically makes them more valuable. Economics 101, when the supply curve is shifted left, equilibrium price will increase. Let's see how this occurred in the past. The first halving occurred in November 2012 when 1 BTC went for around $11 US. The following year, the price began to climb dramatically, reaching an all-time new high of over $1,100 USD in 2013. The price then crashed down to the $220, $240 US range, where it would remain for the next few years. The next halving occurred in July 2016, where BTC stayed in the $580 to $700 range for several months before slowly rising towards the end of the year. The pre and post price performance of Bitcoin has been the most bullish during the 6 to 12 month period preceding the halving dates and the 6 to 12 month period after the halving dates. If we assume that history will repeat itself again, the price of Bitcoin over the next year and a half is very likely to be much higher than it is today. And that may at least help dispel some of the bearish bias surrounding Bitcoin at the moment. The rates of increase of the price from one halving to the next, along with the dates of the halving, are seen in this chart here. The biggest changes in the crypto ecosystem this time around will be the higher public awareness around Bitcoin and the interest of institutional investors. If financial institutions begin taking big positions, 
it could affect Bitcoin in ways investors have never seen before. Regardless, the main takeaway from today's history lesson is this. There is a clear correlation between Bitcoin reward halving and the price volatility afterwards. Let me know your thoughts on this, crypto goers. Is this halving going to see a relatively smaller increase comparative to the other halvings? Or is the fact that more people are understanding Bitcoin and the fact that we have negative interest rates, cash bans, another global financial crisis about to hit the world, potentially war on the horizon, hyperinflation, and greater awareness of not just Bitcoin, but how money works. Could this in fact be a halving event like we've never seen before? Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to know. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Strap yourselves in for the halving. And I'll talk to you next time.